Hello, everyone. Um, so here is, we're going to be talking about the first chapter of Sabrina de Turk's Street Art in the Middle East, which I'm sure you're enjoying. It's one of my favorite books. So we're coming out of the Ottoman Empire, which is where we finished, and we're going all the way into the modern contemporary period. So we're fast forwarding in time quite a bit. Now on Thursday, I'm gonna go back over and we're gonna talk about some of the transitions from the Ottoman Empire to this modern contemporary period because there's a lot of this stuff we need to talk about, but don't worry, we'll come back to that on Thursday. For right now, what you need to know is that with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, Sunni Islam decentralizes. And what I mean by that is, during the Ottoman Empire, you didn't have necessarily separate states or st separate nation states. Everything was centralized in terms of the empire. With the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1918, the Middle East, Africa, and regions uh, in Asia that the Ottoman Empire controlled are going to be broken up into nation states. And again, on Thursday, we're going to talk more about how this evolved and some of the things that are important to remember. So nation states like Egypt, for example, suddenly emerge in the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and become states. So it's a relatively new phenomenon that again happens as a result of Ottoman power receding. And you have kind of this rise of nationalism. Now the rise of nationalism, as we know, <laughs> is uh, very uh, <laughs> kind of, has a lot of different stuff going on here, um, even in our own context and abroad. Uh, in terms of nationalism here, we're going to have to talk about this thing called Arab nationalism. Well, again, we're going to talk more about it on Thursday when we see each other again. But for now, Arab nationalism know that there was this tension as nationalism started to emerge between Arab nationalists who were secularists. They believed in a secular government that was separate from Islam. Okay. Now, there were other people. Right? Other groups and a variety of different groups who believe that Islam should be more integrated within government structures. It's a variety of different groups. In the case of Egypt, we're going to talk about here the Muslim Brotherhood a little bit, which is an example of one of those groups that emerges in the 1920s, 1930s. And again, comes to fruition really in the 2000s as a result of a lot of things, a lot of corruption, as we're going to talk about kind of the failures of nationalism. So there's this tension. And of course, in terms of Western countries, uh, Arab nationalists were seen as potentially threatening. Uh, so, cause of course you have the Soviet Union, you're gonna have the USSR in the backdrop who are gonna be supporting Arab nationalists. Uh, so you're gonna have Western countries like America who are gonna be supporting kind of these Islamic groups or see a vision in which Islam is more integrated into society. Because the idea as we're gonna talk about on Thursday again is that Islam was seen as more synonymous or um, like a friend to Western countries, whereas Arab nationalism was more friendly towards communist countries or had a relationship with communist communism in the USSR. So, you know, the Cold War. So all these things are going to play out, which creates the situation in Egypt in the 2000s. Basically, you have this struggle between this nationalistic impulses that are really reified by the military in Egypt, Egypt's military as we know. And you're gonna have groups like the Muslim Brotherhood who are gonna ferment an alternative vision of society to redress some of the failures of nationalism. So where does this leave the Egyptian people? This is a great question that we're gonna have because it, this it, we shouldn't think about this as binaries or that they're in binary opposition. There's so many diverse ideas and practices. We're talking about why things like murals give Egyptians the abilities to embody all this diversity. Because there's a lot of people who are on like both ways, right? We need more Islam. We need uh, the Islamic ethic of kindness and modesty and humility. That's great for society. Uh, also, we need to really embrace secular and secular secular institutions, they should coexist. These are things that we're going to see. The Arab Spring really brings a lot of this to its head. Um, it begins in 2010. It's a series of protests and uprisings that began in the aftermath of a food crisis and skyrocketing food prices. So what happens is, in the first time uh, in history, we produce a global surplus of food, if you can believe it. 
But that global surplus threatens to bring down the price of food. And as a result, American farmers can't make so, such big of a profit. It creates an issue. So we kind of try to subsidize food prices so that farmers can compete globally, which actually ends up, the surplus ends up causing skyrocketing prices for things like grain. And Egypt at this time is primarily importing its grain, which you might be like, oh my gosh, Egypt's importing its grain? I thought Egypt was a major producer of grain. Yes, they were until the Aswan Dam. It's, it's a horrific and tragic story. Um, in the 1960s, Egypt builds this dam. And the idea with the dam, the Aswan Dam, was to more easily control the Nile floodwaters and actually make Egypt uh, a bigger global competitor in terms of the production of grain, giving farmers more of an ability to control it. Also simultaneously give Egypt and Cairo specifically, its cities, electricity. So it was seen as this like, oh yeah, it's gonna like bring electricity and it's gonna make us even better at agriculture. Well, it does the reverse. Uh, the Aswan Dam is one of the greatest ecological disasters in world history because what it does is it increases saline levels and actually um, hinders the nutrition or the um, basically chemical compounds in the Nile that made it uh, so agriculturally fertile and really hinders farmers' ability to farm the Nile. And the flooding, this, this whole practice of the Nile, the cyclical flooding every year, it actually creates a lot of problems for farmers. It also hurts fisheries because fishing was also a primary um, source of income for Egyptians. Uh, so it hurts the fishes um, and the number of fishes that are in the Nile. Then you get pollution the rise of pollution on the Nile. Um, most communities in Egypt today live along the Nile. If you've ever seen kind of the lights and it's lit up, it's a beautiful, I wish I had the picture. Um, if I have a sec here, maybe I'll bring it up, uh, the, the Nile at night. Let me see if I can bring it up. Oh, I got it. Oh no. That's one damn. Oh, I have a picture of the Nile at night. The Nile from space. I think that's what it is. I gotta get this for you guys. Beautiful photo. I love it. I have it framed. I should just get my framed picture of it. <laughs> All right, let me pop this bad boy up here. Sorry if you hear my dog in the background itching her ears. Okay. Here you go, the Nile from space. So you can see so clearly here that most Egyptian communities are living along the Nile. So this is a horrific problem. I mean, most of the communities live along the Nile. They rely upon the Nile's water. I mean, this is, this is just in terms of not just their income, but this is like their daily water resources. Um, it fundamentally changes life um, and, and destroys their agriculture. And so as a result, Egypt has to import more and more of its food, and it does. So this uh, global food skyrocketing price crisis has a big impact on countries like Egypt. Also Tunisia, Syria, Morocco, Palestine, these are all countries that are really um, impacted by this. So what happens is Mohamed Bouazizi, he's a food vendor in Tunisia, and he's so fed up I mean, it, it was a horrific, people were starving to death. This was a real, some of you guys might not remember it because you were younger at the time, but it, it was horrific. Uh, and he's driven to the point of self-immolation. So he lights himself on fire. I mean, you can imagine the horror of what this man was going through to do something like that. I mean, it was horrifying, tragic. He eventually dies, a very painful, slow death. I mean, it's hard to even fathom. So the tragedy of his death really lights off what's going to be called the Arab Spring, which is po protests that take place across kind of Egypt. They start in Tunisia, then they spread to Syria and primarily Egypt. Um, now, what do these protests represent? What are the issues? A kind of frustration, a frustration with the system as it was. At the time, Egypt was being led by kind of a 
in the military, the military per se, and the, it, ha it had a president and constitution, but really reinforced by a certain militarism. Um, and he was a secular national leader. Um, so it kind of left Egypt, who were fed up by this military system and the militarization of this system, who were just like, we need something else. We need something different. We cannot live this way um, in a constant state of dependency. So what, what can we do? So basically these protests erupt um, and come to a head in what's called Tahir Square, or the Martyr Square, an important square, and really becomes um, a focal point and symbol for the ongoing protests. Um, on, on February 2nd, violence erupts between the pro-Mubarak, and again, Mubarak's the president at the time, so between the pro-Mubarak and pro-democracy <laughs> demonstrators there, followed by the fr February 3rd, the Friday of departure demonstration. So it's one of the important dates and kind of solidifies and ends the Arab Spring um, because kind of is the beginning and the end of it in some ways, because at that point, to hear square images of what's going on with everybody coming into the square and demonstrating against the government gets into the global media. And that's when images start coming to America and places like that. And with America becoming concerned in other countries, of course, the Egyptian government becomes very concerned. They end up ousting Mubarak. We know that the Muslim Brotherhood eventually comes in with Morsi. But of course, Morsi isn't allowed to last long. And he's usurped from power. And then, of course, the military just takes full control over the country. And to this day, Sisi uh, and the military leader uh, maintains his power over the country. So the Arab Spring has kind of this mixed legacy because it embodied with it a certain hope for change in the future. Sorry, that's my dog <laughs> making those noises in the background. Uh, so she's itching her ears. But really, it, it, it was this period of hope for change. Uh, this was also during the time of President Obama and the Obama administration who also embodied these things. And I can tell you, I was a young student at the time uh, going through a lot of this and I felt it too. There was a certain hope like in a better future, a better system that we could create. And yet the Arab Spring ends in Egypt with just Sisi and the military taking over. So what, what change did it bring? What has it fermented? And I think that's a question that we have to think about. And I think art really allows us to reflect on this question. Um, so one of these important movements that we see happening during this period of time is the creation, the formation, and spread of murals. Murals throughout Egypt, specifically in Cairo um, and in large cities in Egypt. Um, Murals are important if we think about them as a social strategy and really the aesthetics of murals. So what's the point of murals? Where do they come from? In the book, Sabrina de Turk points out that murals in general seem to come from Mexico. Mexico has a long tradition of painting murals. They date all the way back to Olmec civilization uh, before the Spanish get there. So mural, murals had existed for a while. Oh my gosh, my dog is being real bad. Give me one sec. <laughs> Can you slide around? I'm huh? trying to film. Can you look around? Oh. She's being a bad poochie. Oh. You're being a bad poochie. Oh. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> leave it to my dog. Has the worst timing. She was sleeping, I swear, for like three hours. And then as soon as I start filming, she starts being naughty. All right. So in Mexico, the tradition of murals it was really tr tied to, although they existed for a very long time, and they actually were used by the Catholic Church as a form of propaganda to propagandize Catholicism. Uh, because one of the things that murals allow you to do, because they're so large and big, right? A mural is something large, big, you put on a wall. You can put a lot of stuff in a mural, put a lot of different elements. You can mix and merge different styles. And Catholicism liked that in Mexico because we kind of talked a um, little bit about this, but the Catholic tradition in general um, is based upon this idea of, at least in Mexico, they wanted to create this mixing and merging culture uh, where they took elements from indigenous traditions and mixed them with Catholicism. 
Catholicism to create a unique merger and amalgamation. So that's kind of the background of why Catholicism adapted muralism. But then muralism comes back in the 1920s, 1930s, in the aftermath of the Mexican Revolution um, against kind of the Spanish elite. It comes back. Uh, one of the things that she says in the book is it kind of serves as a form of catharsis over what the country had endured during the war. So a lot of the times in the murals in the 1920s and 30s in Mexico, we see this kind of uh, reference to tragedy, to trauma, to persevering, this notion of perseverance. Um, specifically, Diego Rivera is one of the most famous muralists who also paints a lot of murals in 1930s America. He's actually hired by the government at the time to make these murals. And they did, in addition to serving as a form of catharsis, they also functioned as a form of propaganda in terms of the government that wanted to solidify its status as a legitimate government. Um, so <laughs> they kind of used murals, painted them around the country to say, here's your government, here's your country, and we're united. Um, so Diego Rivera, in this example of a mural, you can see he's referencing allusions to kind of indigenous to an ancient past, but he's using modern techniques it looks modern, doesn't it? It looks contemporary almost, um, while making this reference to the past, to antiquity. So one of the things he's trying to say here is this idea that the present kind of embodies and reifies that past, that the in the aftermath of the Mexican Revolution, you know, what is Mexican society? To see it as the inheritors of this grand tradition. And, and we know that Mexico City, so here it is a reference to the ancient Mexican, uh, ancient city, <laughs> ancient Mexico City, so, um, <clears throat> which is at one time was really a water city, using water to get around, to farm, all these things. So it was advanced. So the point here he's making is the past was advanced, sophisticated, like technologically sophisticated. And we as Mexicans today need to embody that ethos. So that's muralism. It's really effective in making messages and spreading messages, which is why it's often used for propaganda by the government. But in addition to being used as propaganda for the government, it can also be used by activists very effectively, specifically in the case of the Egyptian um, revolution during kind of 2011, 2013. We see the use of muralism come back into Egypt. Specifically, it's not being used by the government but it's being used by activists who are trying to subvert government authority. So she uses the example of the girl in the blue bra, which becomes a very popular mural that springs up around Egypt. So the girl in the blue bra is based on something that actually a tra traumatic event that happened to a young woman who was arrested and beaten in public by the police and stripped. So she was brutalized by the police in public and someone snapped a photo. And that photo appeared and spread among people on social media. And you gotta remember in the Arab Spring, some of y'all were young, but some of you can probably remember uh, that the Arab Spring was really the birth of digital technology, social media as a form of social activism. Uh, we didn't, event this, uh, I often hear people say, well, in the US, you know, social media, it was not invented as social activism. It was um, people in the Arab Spring who showed American activists how effective social media could be used as a form of activism and then was adopted here. So the girl in the blue bra is an example of that in that that, that video, or excuse me, the photo was shown on Facebook and shared and even popped up on my Facebook. I saw it and that's how effective it was. And basically the the, image of the blue bra pops up around Egypt. Yes, it is a sign of the brutality of the police state, of the state surveillance, and this kind of brutalization that everybody feels. The fact that she isn't, her face is covered is very important, as Sabrina de Turk says. This case of an anonymity, an anonymous, being anonymous, this is very important in murals and street arts as well, this feeling of being anonymous. So let's go to this a little bit, talk a little bit more about this um, and the lack of a face. 
This is very important too, because she's gonna talk about stenciling. So in the case of the girl in the blue bra, they make it using this stenciling technique. Banksy, if you know about Banksy, he's that English British artist <laughs> who uh, is anonymous, remains anonymous. We're gonna go into Banksy a lot more too. Banksy's gonna come up a lot as you're gonna see. Um, so he's an, she, he, they, uh, Banksy is probably a group of people is what I've heard most recently, a uh, collection of, of different people and might not just be British, but might be a collection. Banksy is evolving. It's more of a community is what I've heard, but it's anonymous. Really Banksy popularizes that. Um, so why is an, being anonymous important? So first of all, stenciling is very important because it allows you to be anonymous because you can't tell who the artist is right? Anybody can have a stencil. Anybody can use a stencil. There's a certain universalism with a stencil. So you can't tell, for example, right, your handwriting. They can't tell, oh, that handwriting matches, right? That art matches. Why? Well, A, to protect these people making the street art. They need to be protected from the police. If the police know the about, for example, the girl in the blue bra who made that, they're going to arrest them and brutalize them. So A, it's a form to, of protecting them. It's also a form of overcoming state surveillance. So, you know, you can get around that. The state can't track you. This is important. So you can still do your forms of expression without being tracked. But also let's think about being anonymous as a form of aesthetics that allows you to re resist capitalism. This is why Banksy, I think, is so popular right now. Because with capitalism, there's this idea of being an individual. You must be an individual. It's very important. Me, 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 me. A certain narcissism with capitalism. You are special and important. But you're not, right? <laughs> like, that's the thing. Capitalism promises you that to sell you products, but it's a false hope. It's a false illusion to get you to buy something, to be owned. Oftentimes, that belief is used by politicians and corporations to take advantage of you, to get you into a situation where you end up getting ripped off. Right? Anybody seen a used car salesman or anybody had that experience? Happened to me many a times. Um, it's very effective. They make you feel special, personal, that you have a unique identity. You're like, oh, okay. So it's very important for capitalism. So this becomes an aesthetic tradition or an artistic tradition of being anonymous, creating anonymous art that allows you to resist capitalism. And this is very important because during the Egyptian re revolution, the resistance to capitalism was very important. Some of the streams and themes, again, it's really hard. On Thursday, we can talk more about it. If you're asking me, what are some of the themes Themes, aesthetics, ideas, so diverse. There's so many different ideas. We get environmentalism, uh, resistance to capitalism. I mean, all sorts of Islam, as we're going to talk about, Islam is going to be at the forefront. Islamic ethics of kindness, of compassion are going to be seen as a way to resist capitalism. These are all going to be really, really important. So being anonymous it is a way of being that allows you to subvert these kind of capitalist impulses that are destroying your society and also allowing you to be tracked by the government. So it's kind of, you can get them both. You can get a uh, um, kind of challenge state surveillance and also capitalism at the same time. So this becomes very important. So the blue bra, the girl in the blue bra pops up all around Egypt and so frustrating to the government because they're like, who is doing this? You can't tell because it's a universal stencil that's being passed around between artists. It also leads to the question too, you know, like what makes art? I think we always come back to this idea too. In that stenciling, if I take someone's stencil and I use that to spray paint a blue bra on the wall, that's art, right? I'm an artist, right? Even though I have no training, anything like that, it is an expression. So this is very important too. We'll come back to this on Thursday, of course, as we talk about that. So that's something else to think about. And also being anonymous allows you to be part of this wider community. You know, this individualism, as we've talked a little bit about, but individualism really, um, you know, it makes you feel alienated. It's isolating. 
this, oh, me, 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 me. Thinking about yourself all the time really stuck. It's, yeah, it stings sometimes because it's like the narcissism is its own, uh, leads to your own undoing because you're alienated, isolated. You have no friends, you know, because you're too me, 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 me. So being anonymous allows you to just fit within a community and just kind of like go with the flow. It's, um, this comes up too in the Big Lebowski. This is a theme for those who love, I don't know, the Big Lebowski came out when I was young. So that was like, cool. I know it's probably like an old film for y'all, but <laughs> I loved it. Um, but this kind of go with the flow, like, you know, like, I don't care, like, whatever, like, you know, be relaxed in the face of brutality. Um, being relaxed, being cool. This is something where that's going to come up when we get to Muslim cool is the ultimate way to resist police brutality sometimes. This is very important to not allow such violence and brutality to dehumanize you and to frustrate makes you anxious because the goal of such brutality is to make you stressed out, is to make you anxious. But if you don't allow yourself, right, instead you say, you know what, I'm going to be more relaxed, I'm going to be more cool, I'm going to be than you because you can't affect me. So that's part of this kind of idea too with this aesthetics of being anonymous, just kind of blending in in a relaxed way, right? I'm just hanging out kind of thing. Again, we'll come back, back to this in Muslim cool. So part of the street arts along with this is this whole cultural tradition of being relaxed, not being anxious and choosing to be anonymous. Um, so some of the things I see at social media, for example, they will all take the same name which starts to frustrate Facebook. Facebook gets really frustrated by this. Uh, they don't want the same Facebook walls. It's like a, a replica replication of like 200 different Facebooks that are the same, which makes it impossible for the government to track. It's all the same photo. It's all the same person. Everything's aligning. Like, who is it? Who is this person? Um, so it's really effective. Okay. Um, so this is another example. Ooh, and then we got to talk about women. This is really important. This is kind of, I'm going to conclude a little bit here, kind of go another 20 minutes or so. Uh, this idea of women and the role of women in street art in Egypt is very important. So Sabrina Duterte talks about this idea of ancient Egyptian motifs, themes, and symbols, specifically the idea of Nefertiti. Uh, so Nefertiti, who was she? She was an ancient Egyptian um, kind of leader. She was the wife of Akhenaten, and she participated in his religious revolution. So generally, historically, she's associated with upending the social and political order. So a rebel, a rebel to a certain degree, uh, and that's kind of associated with going against corruption, going against the elite. So she's from the elite, but she defies and turns against, she's kind of like a traitor, the enemy from within. She betrays her own elite um, to kind of undo their own corruption. Now, whether or not that's true or not, that's of course, you know, we're, we're filling in some historical details. As Sabrina de Turks uh, mentions, uh, you know, that's probably not true, but that, that in the Egyptian revolution, Nefertiti takes on this idea. So let me make a distinction there because some of you guys are like, I know about ancient Egyptian history, I don't know. This is the idea that Nefertiti takes on uh, in the 2000s during this Egyptian revolution as being this rebel, this rebel, an elite educated woman. And one of the things that we see in the Egyptian revolution was this call to the women of the elite, the rich, wealthy, educated women to join in with the people, to turn against their order, to realize that their order was against them was hindering them. And in fact, during the revolution, we saw a lot of that. We see a lot of college educated uh, women from kind of well-off families joining the revolution. So here, this image is, is sending this message out to women in Egypt, join us, right? Educated, wealthy women who are maybe walking to their college um, class, you know, join us, you're along with it because the system is against you. So you see here on this, again, anonymous, uh, graffiti here, Nefertiti in a gas mask. Kind of this spray paint blood beneath her. And her eyes are super fierce, super fierce. So what's going on here? What's, and again, you got to understand they're also dealing with env extreme environmental issues. Nile's being polluted, it's being contaminated. There's 
absolutely horrific ecological environmental degradation going on in Egypt. Just clear the allusions to this um, the smog, the levers of smog um, that you're breathing in every day that are also hurting you, right? Rich or poor, you gotta breathe in that air. It's also destroying your lungs as well. This environment, environmental ecological degradation, while temporarily it might benefit the rich and give them temporary profit, over the long term, it screws them too. They have to deal with the same problems as the poor um, and that it will hurt their lungs, it will hurt their children as well. Um, also, it's an allusion to the fact that, of course, they would be wearing, uh, protesters would be wearing gas masks because what is the ultimate kind of uh, pollutant contaminant in the air during the protests? It's from police. Police are throwing, um, uh, what, <sighs> I'm just dropping out of my head, um, but uh, to break up crowds and things like that, um, which destroy your eyes, make you cry, right? Uh, and really have long-term horrific health effects. We can talk more about this on Thursday, um, but it's really horrific, the health effects that this has on people um, long-term, but it's used often to break up crowds and it's being used here in Egypt to break up these protests. So they're using gas to gas the protests and causing long-term health impacts. So here in Nefertiti with the gas mask, she's represented too as part of the protest. She's a protester, right? Because protesters would be wearing the gas mask if they could afford it. Um, again, and probably maybe a wealthy protester could afford it here, here, you know? Um, maybe poor protesters can't afford that, but here she's with them. So Nefertiti is with the protesters. It also shows that ancient Egypt, Egyptian history and mythology is very important for the Egyptian state because the Egyptian state often represents themselves as kind of the inheritor of this great ancient Egyptian empire and tradition. We are just like them. We were like ancient Egypt. So the Egyptian government co-ops a lot of this ancient Egyptian motifs, themes, aesthetic elements into their own government propaganda to represent themselves as great as the great ancient Egyptian empire. Here, we see that it's not being associated with the government, but it's being associated with protesters. So protesters are saying in this image, you are not, you know, you, the government does, is not the inheritors of the ancient Egyptian tradition of the great empire. We are. And Nefertiti is with us. So history is against the government and history is with us. Um, and I think it's a really effective method here and strategy of, making this point and it's also a call to action. Nefertiti looks fierce and she looks serious. But again, we're gonna see a lot of women in revolutionary art in Egypt, but something that Sabrina de Turk brings up is that it's a complicated legacy. As we're gonna see, this is an idealization of women's roles in the revolution. Because as we're gonna see, women are gonna be in a tough situation in this revolution. They're gonna face extreme amounts of violence from men, they're really risking their lives, their bodies. Um, and oftentimes within the protests, their voices are being maligned and marginalized. This was a problem. Um, and Sabrina de Turk mentions this problem, you know, like, so we, it's a complicated history, a complicated legacy. So we must also read that in the art, right? In that Nefertiti image, that's an idealization of what's happening, what women's role, what they hope it to be, but that is not what it is. Um, an image that gets more to this tension is Amar Abu Bakr's uh, representation of Aliyah El Mahdi and Samira Ibrahim. So who are they and why are they important to the revolution? Well, Mahdi um, becomes very important because she posts nude photos of herself on social media as a form of protest against the government's uh, extreme surveillance laws that were particularly um, harsh against women. Uh, women cannot be nude. Showing nudes um, on social media is banned in our society in America, also banned in Egypt. Moreover, you'd be faced severe punishment. So what Mahdi was doing was a criminal act and one which would have horrific implications on her, but she posted them as a way of saying, you know, um, a few to the, to the government. Um, I remember there was something similar during the BLM protests, um, which you guys can remind me of on Thursday, because I think um, 
I'm, I'm dropping out of my, out of my head here, out of my mind. Um, but there was a protester I remember who was nude, um, who completely stripped everything and then kind of was facing the police. And then someone took a photo and it became kind of emblematic of the BLM protests. Uh, this is something similar, what Mahdi was doing. Um, now, on the so Mahdi was kind of doing nude, uh, stripping herself, but Samira Abraham faced something completely different in that she underwent virginity tests. So she was basically forcibly underwent uh, with men doing this virginity test on her forcibly probing her sexual organs after she was arrested for protesting in Tahir Square. So a, a horrific rape by the state using instruments, right? Like metallic machinic instruments to rape her um, after she's arrested. And it happened to a lot of women, but really Samira Ibrahim and El Mahdi really uh, popularized like, or for men, this, this what women were undergoing, because as we saw with Girl in the Blue uh, Bra, women were undergoing extreme dehumanization and brutalization by the state and the police. And historically, they have as well. Here in this image points to a lot of stuff, a lot of things. First off, you notice that we don't see Mahdi nude, but instead we see Arabic writing. And the Arabic writing is pointed to, um, if you can't read Arabic, it's, it's okay, I'll tell you. Um, it's saying that millions of people viewed El Mahdi's nude photos. Millions, right? Millions. And did they view it as a form of protest or for something else? That's another thing. Were they sexualizing her too? You know, was it a form of sexualization too? You know, and her, so El Mahdi is a, gains a lot more notoriety and popularity than Samira Abraham. In fact, a lot don't know her name. So in this other comment down here, you see Samira Abraham, who's wearing a hijab, and you see only her face is showing, not her body. It's very important. Um, we see the uh, Amaris basically is saying in Arabic here, yet no one knows Samira Abraham and her lawsuit against the state for basically forcibly raping her by having her undergo this virginity test. We don't want to talk about, we don't know it. Why? Why isn't her face, why isn't her body remembered in the same way Mahdi's body is? You know, what's what's happening here? And, and you can see too, it's very interesting. Mahdi, check this out. Mahdi's looking at us, right? She's pointed at us. Eyes are dead center with us. Whereas Samira Abraham is looking away. She's kind of like, she's not making our eye, not needing the eye contact, right? We're almost like, and and the point here is like as it's almost as if Samir Abraham is just passing by us and we're completely missing her, right? She's just someone on the street passing us by. We don't even notice her. Yet Mahdi, we're well, you'll notice her, right? She's staring at you. You can't help but notice her. And so I think Amar Abu Bakr is pointing to this idea of women's complicated role and relationship here with the protests. Um, and that the protests here, there was a certain form of brutalization of women as well. I mean, on both sides. This, this is, uh, or, or at least in the case of Abraham, why don't we remember her? Why isn't her story being told and remembered in that way? So I, I think here it points to this kind of double gender standard and really this idea that on both sides, um, women are being brutalized. I mean, women and their role and their status and their voice is one that's constantly, you know, it's, it's, Rock in a hard place, I guess, is the idea. As women are fighting for more power in these protests at the same time, they're being overlooked and brutalized by that, as they are with the police and the state. So it, it's kind of like women's changing roles and movements and, and what that means when we think about gender. So that's one thing that I want you to pay attention to. And this is where, what we're going to come back to in the case of Lebanon. As I finish up here, it's the role of gender. One thing that we're going to see a lot of in street art in the Middle East is a lot of focus on gender, on, on the role and status specifically of women. We're also going to see uh, sexuality come up. Here, the idea of sexuality is being presented to us. Uh, you kind of have Mahdi is going for a more secular, kind of liberal, anything goes, nude, kind of pushback. Uh, at the same time, Samira Abraham is a devoted Muslim. 
who wears hijab, who is also having her own unique form of resistance and protest to the state, right? And both are important forms of protest here. We need to think about um, women's roles and status because oftentimes it's seen as conservative Muslim women or devoted Muslim women are somehow um, not part of the protest or uh, themselves are being persecuted, things like that. But actually here the artist is telling us that a form of that devotional practice to Islam can be a form of protest. The hijab can be a form of protest, specifically in Egypt where deveiling, so the Egyptian government forcibly deveiled women um, and forbid wearing hijab for a very long time because Islam was seen as dangerous and a threat to nationalism and nationalistic sentiment. So the hijab literally has a history here, specifically in Egypt, of being a form of protest to the state. And many see this kind of forcible devaling of the state as stripping and, and kind of uh, dehumanizing and brutalizing women by the state. No, you don't get to tell me what I wanna do with my body. That's up to me. And so all this we see embodied in this art. Um, so on Thursday, we're going to come back to Lebanon. Hopefully this gets kind of conversation going. And you guys, I know we'll have a lot of questions. So when we meet back on Thursday, just write down those questions, have them ready on Thursday. Also, in addition to this video, I'm going to leave a clip about the Arab Spring for you to watch as well. So make sure after you watch this video, you watch this clip about the Arab Spring. that will give you a better idea of everything that's going on. All right. I'll see you guys Wednesday.